when we consider everything that the Almighty has done and our knowledge of it and what it should do for us in our lives, it is the most explosive dynamic force that there could be. The reality that one day soon there will be a knock upon the door. And everything that is ordinary and mundane will stop. And the Lord will be here. And all those things, all those things, and all those promises that the saints of all ages have been waiting for will find their fulfilment in the coming of the Lord. And all those ungodly sinners who you remember that Jude spoke about, who uses that word ungodly about five times, doesn't he? Of those hard speeches that ungodly sinners have spoken against him will, will all vanish before the glory of the Son of God. And we know these things. And how does it affect us? I want to start in Revelation 22, brothers and sisters, just with a little verse, and then we'll pick up the theme again in, in uh, Revelation 16. Because there's an implication here which I think is helpful, and there are two ideas, really, I want to take from it. So it's verse 17 of Revelation 22. Now, you remember the context. We've just had that wonderful last chapter with a vision that connects us all the way back to Genesis and shows Eden restored and the purpose of God come to its fulfilment. And then right towards the end of the chapter, we have these closing words of the Lord himself, who in verse 16 says that he has sent his angel to testify unto you these things. And then he says in verse 17, And the spirit and the bride say, Come. Now, it's not immediately apparent, even once we're clear that the Spirit, who the Spirit and the Bride is, it's not even immediately apparent to whom the come is addressed. It, it could be addressed to Jesus in a way, couldn't it? I mean, the last verse says, uh, even so come Lord Jesus, or verse 20 says. But, but of course, it's not actually addressed to Jesus, is it? Because... The Spirit and the Bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come. And here's the point. Let him that is a thirst come. Right? And he's going to drink the waters of life. This is Isaiah 55, isn't it? That whole beautiful picture of the Almighty giving life-giving water to anybody who will come. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Don't spend your life, says Isaiah. Labouring for the meat which can never bring satisfaction, but that which I will freely give you. So, the Spirit, very often, is not necessarily the Lord God speaking whatever way, although it could be in some context, but it's also to do with that disposition of mind, isn't it, that's brought about by an understanding of God's ways. That the attitude of mind that we should have when we read these things is influenced by this word that we read. And the bride is saying, come. And the bride is appealing in this verse to those who are athirst. Let him that is athirst come and drink of the water of life. And come to know of the truth and the wonder and the hope of these pages. So there is a responsibility then on the bride, isn't there, to be clearly and distinctly holding out this word. And the bride, the bride in the context of what we've read in Revelation is unique, isn't she? Because there is another woman, isn't there, in Revelation? Just as there is in Proverbs, the true bride and that which is a parody of the true bride. A, a dreadful, a dreadful kind of distorted view of a bride is the harlot that we have in Revelation. And the true bride is speaking the truth and appealing to him that is a thirst to come. So that the voice of the bride has to be clearly and distinctly heard. And the bride is the ecclesia, isn't she? And she's speaking forth that voice. And interestingly enough that in that verse we also have him that hears. Now, it's intriguing, isn't it? Because whereas the bride is a corporate body, him who hears, we met first of all in chapter 1, blessed are those who 
hear and keep the words of this prophecy. And the individual then is spoken of. So that whether collectively or individually, that which we believe has to drive us and motivate us to speak that word to others. And most of all, that it might be the character of our life and our way of thinking, the spirit of our mind in that sense. So this verse is at one and the same time an invitation for the bride to invite, if you like, to speak clearly and to proclaim that message that he that is a thirst might come. But there is another reason also for this verse. Because there is a spirit in our age, to use that word again, a way of thinking that, well, is all about what has become known as ecumenism. I think I said that correctly, but it's basically the idea, isn't it, that all of us are going to come together, all these churches. And a thousand years of history is being, well, is being set aside, isn't it? Between the Eastern Church and the Roman Church. And what is the significance of this in Revelation? It is that the mother and her daughters at the end are going to be together. And the true bride is holding out the truth. And there are these other voices. And how world, we talked about those three spirits, and brotherhood is one of them. Here is a brotherhood of a kind. And a recognition, you'll just see the headline, they're intriguing, that in this latest rapprochement between the East and West leaders of the church, that Putin himself played a part in bringing it about. Just as he, from the very beginning of his presidency, has raised the profile of the Russian Orthodox Church. And it's another aspect of those things that bind those of that Russian perspective together. So, alongside that... And this is very topical because the 31st of October was Reformation Day. It's 500 years since Martin Luther pinned up, well, at least in the popular imagination, we shall take it roughly thereabouts, since Martin Luther apparently put up those 95 theses that said the Roman Church is wrong and it's not right to worship Mary and to pray to saints and to do all those other things. And that's the foundation, isn't it, of the idea of the Protestant movement. <coughs> And there was a time when people in this country stood aside and said, we won't have any of that. And those explosions that are going on out there are the reminiscence, aren't they, of a time when that battle in this country was very prominent. That's really where the gunpowder plot was all about, wasn't it? But those things are all being set aside. A thousand years written off, 500 years written off in the move of ecumenism. And in that context, the voice of the bride has to sound clearly and distinctly that others might come to learn to drink of the water of life. So there's quite a challenge, it seems to me. I, I often think about the difference between, it struck me as, as we read about Hezekiah and his attempts to unify the nation and Jehoshaphat. I mean, Hezekiah invited the others into, didn't he, his worship. And he said, this is where I stand. Whereas Jehoshaphat, perhaps for the best of motives, was trying to join with Israel and invited his own son to join in an alliance which was condemned with the house of Ahab. And look at the trouble that that caused. So the voice of the bride has to sound to speak these words, to speak as we, in, as we are seeking to share that wonderful saving truth with others. And it's in that context then of a world which is increasingly coming together in its own perspective. And quite an interesting case that that should be. When we come to Ezekiel 38 then, and we thought about the position that the world had to be in. And, and we shall come back. I should have made the link, sorry. We're going to come back to the idea of the bride presently, having established where the bride ends up and what she's going to do. That's another aspect of her role that, that we'll be thinking about. 
What then about our world and what about the things that we are waiting for before this position is made fully where it needs to be for the prophecies? And how much of that will we see? which of course in a sense is an unanswerable question, but what clues there are. Well, we talked about cattle and goods. What about this dwelling safety that I skipped over? So the first thing to say is that there is to be a time when Israel dwells safely because they recognise their Messiah and King. That much is simple and straightforward, isn't it? Because it's plainly stated in Jeremiah 23 that when the King reigns, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. No question about that. And as we have it in Ezekiel 34, they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, but they shall dwell safely and none shall make them afraid. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. So clearly, in those verses, the dwelling safely is tied to their recognition of their Messiah. But there are some other verses. Just consider this one. Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and will be jealous for my holy name, after that they have borne their shame, and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land. So that verse appears to be saying that the point at which they dwelt safely was when they were trespassing. After that they have borne their shame and their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land. Okay, so clearly there is a time when they dwell safely because they recognise the Lord and they're in covenant relationship with him. And presumably at that point they're not trespassing against him. But this verse appears to be saying that there is also a time when they dwell safely. But the point is that dwelling safely comes to an end. Because Gog invades. So this time of dwelling safely is associated with their sin, not with them being in covenant relationship with God. And it's not the same as when they dwell safely with God because it's going to be invaded it's going to be interrupted by the invader. And we have a similar idea in both Ezekiel 38 and Joel 3. Joel 3 talks about strangers passing through their land. So if that's the case, and I appreciate I've only just put up a couple of very brief ideas there. But the fact is, when we look in the past, it's difficult to see the dwelling safely already having happened, I think. And... It, if it's somewhere in the future, whether it's about because of God's action in covenant relationship or whether, as that verse seems to suggest, at an initial point because of at the point at which they're being disobedient, it doesn't look from where we are now particularly likely. But you see, we have had something, haven't we, brothers and sisters? And whether you agree with that or not, this I think is true, that things can change very quickly. Remember the Berlin Wall. How long did it take for the Berlin Wall to fall? Or at least for that, for that ability of East and West to be united. It was a matter of days, as I recall. And that which had been in place as an edifice, and Churchill had talked about the Iron Curtain coming down over Europe, suddenly was no longer there. And the citizens of Europe found themselves united in an extraordinary way. Well, the position of Ezekiel 38 requires that there are cities dwelling without walls and without bars and gates. And there is, as we well know in Israel, a wall that would need to be taken down for that prophecy to be fulfilled. Let us not, brothers and sisters, whatever we make of these verses, let us not fall into the mistake of trying to second-guess the Almighty in that things can happen very quickly. If it is his will... It will happen. There's an interesting parallel to me. This was some words that Brother Thomas wrote in 1865. Well, actually, they're, they're not words he wrote. They're the responses to words he'd written. When he talked, like he had in Help Us Israel, about Israel going back to the land, some other brethren published a magazine, our, our brethren, and they said, Dr. Thomas teaches a pastoral, a pastoral 
restoration of Israel before the advent. Others of the brethren look for no restoration till the Lord comes. And it's almost incredible to us now, having seen it happen, that there could any but have been a time when people didn't believe Israel would go back in our community, but they did. Ezekiel points to a people newly collected, which would seem to warrant the belief of a partial restoration before Christ comes. But on the other hand, we as yet see no signs of a partial restoration. And yet we are all looking for the appearance of our great master within a few four or five years. If the advent is to be on us within four or five years, would you not be looking for a commotion of some sort among the Jews? Okay, so the most obvious thing to start with is four or five years. Clearly their expectations were wrong in terms of time. And is it not the case that every generation of believer has been led by the scripture to see the Lord at the door in their own lifetime? Because if, even if you knew how far through the book of Revelation you were, you did not know how long it would take for the rest to be fulfilled. In fact, probably the only one who got close to it was Daniel, wasn't it? And he was absolutely horrified. And if that's true, and he did have some sense of the length of time, no wonder he was sick certain days and couldn't, do, couldn't get off his bed because it was just unbelievable, if I'm understanding that correctly. But, so we understand that God's purposes are over a long period. But the direction was clear. And look at the point. Ezekiel seems to be saying it, but it doesn't look very likely. So when we approach prophecy, we must always say, what is the scripture saying? Not, does it look likely? In God's time, Ezekiel 38 will fit the picture he has set, however unlikely it looks. However unlikely it looked that Russia in the 1990s would conform to that picture, come the end, it will. However unlikely it looked that Britain would leave Europe, it would happen when God said, Now, what's so striking is that it seems there are many similarities between some of the accounts that we have of this time. And I'm, you'll forgive me, I'm not going to go through in huge detail all of these. This warrants more study in its own right. But it does seem that many of the patterns are repeated in several of these passages. I know this view isn't universally shared, but it seems to me that you can trace several of the features of what we have in Ezekiel, in Joel. Certainly you notice there that we have nations being gathered, we have an earthquake, we have God pleading or judging the nations, we have Israel destroyed, and the end result, of course, is the same. Zechariah 14 similarly talks of Israel being in their land, nations being gathered, Yahweh intervening, a great earthquake, soldiers fighting each other. And Daniel certainly records of the Yahweh intervening, the confederacy by the northern invader, and Israel delivered. And the things that are going to lead up to that ultimate event occurring, in one sense, are clear enough, aren't they? Interesting that both Daniel records the use of a time of trouble for Israel, while Luke, recording the words of the Lord Jesus, talks upon, about the Gentiles and the time of distress for nations as a whole. And the sense of the words behind it is very, very much the same, whether it's for Israel, a time of straits and distress, or whether it be for the Gentiles, a holding together, a narrowing of the way. And we've seen, perhaps, just the beginning of some of those clues. Well, we've seen what can happen at any rate, can't we? That was actually the devastating effects of an earthquake in Italy, not just this most recent one, but, but a few years back. So we know where it's going to end up. But it's not entirely clear, entirely clear, is it, in the prophecies, at what point the saints are called away. Except the Lord to say, doesn't he? When these things begin to come to pass. So that it, it's not a, a, a necessary, is it, for us to see all those things happening. In fact, we wouldn't expect to see all of those things happening. And here lies the great exhortation for us in our day-to-day -day lives. You see, we spoke earlier, didn't we, about the gathering that the Lord is doing. The gathering of the nations. 
And we spoke about the gathering of Israel and the way those two things are connected. But of course there's a third, isn't there? Because there's the gathering of the saints. And the Lord is working to bring about his purpose. That's, after all, what Revelation 16 was saying. And you notice how very precisely the Lord Jesus spoke of his coming at a particular point. There was, on the one hand, the gathering of the nations in the going out of the unclean spirit, or at least the beginning of that process. And on the other, the gathering together to Armageddon. In between was the point at which the Lord came. So that Christ's return to the household we have some events before and some events after. But the Lord's return to us, then, is at any time. Just think how the New Testament lays out those principles. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, says Paul. But Peter says judgment must begin at the house of God. Isn't that interesting? When these things begin to come to pass, well, judgment must begin with the saints. He's going to judge the world. He's going to bring about the events we thought about in our first address. But before any of that, he's going to judge the household. And that's the reason why, isn't it, in Revelation 16. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together. Against who? To make war against him that sat on the horse which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is faithful and true, but he's not on his own in that picture, is he? Against his army, those who are with him, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it therefore follows that when they are with him, and he's bringing about God's will in the earth, and all are coming to understand the true God of Israel, well then they must already, the saints must already have been judged with him, mustn't they? Just consider this as we're thinking about the dwelling safely. This knows, says the Lord Jesus Christ, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken through. The Lord just seems to pick it up, doesn't he? Behold, I come as a thief when the world is not expecting and when perhaps we're in danger of not expecting. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. So this is intriguing because... What would be the circumstance in the world then that would lead us to be least expecting his coming to us? And ask yourself the question the other, way, the other way around. And think of our community and think when, perhaps, if one could make a generalisation, when were the times, uh, perhaps you have lived through or you have heard of, when we were most sort of geared up for the coming of the Lord? Was it not around times of conflict? Was it not around 1948 or 67 when we saw the evident hand of God's fulfilment with the nation and then things went quiet? For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes on them. Now that's the world. But then, ye brethren are not in darkness. So the disciple, perhaps, is being warned to look for a temporary respite, a time of peace and safety. The world breathes a sigh of relief. And we know it's the last time, and the Lord is at the door. But it's, but, but it's dangerous, isn't it? Because when everything goes quiet, when perhaps Israel dwells safely, perhaps the household thinks, well, then he's not coming yet, because it'll be a time of war when the Lord comes. When the Lord comes to the world, yes, but not perhaps to us. Is this when the world says peace and safety? Whichever way it be, brothers and sisters, the reality of it is what we need to engage with. The fact that the Lord is at the door and we don't need, do we, to see any of those great things happening. We've seen perhaps the beginning of those processes, but as far as we individually are concerned, the Lord could come, couldn't he? Any day. So what's the exhortation of the Lord in Revelation 16? <clears throat> Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. You're perhaps familiar with the idea of the temple guard who had to stay awake all night and watch 
over the temple. And make sure, lest at any point he should fall asleep. And losing his clothes, or yet worse, might be the outcome. It's interesting that the components of verse 15 are drawn from two letters to the ecclesias that we have in Revelation. In, to Sardis, who had a name as living but was dead, we find the idea of being watchful, lest he come as a thief. And to Laodicea, there was the word to buy white raiment, to be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Almost as though the Lord is saying to us, be on your guard. That there's a danger that this might be the environment that perhaps you begin to wonder about. That we might individually be looking for him. Because we know he is coming. And when he calls us, there will be a day when everything we know as ordinary and normal will just fade away. Everything that is, we just take for granted will disappear as we find that we are being summoned to judgment. And I don't know how it will happen, brothers and sisters, whether it will be the knock at the door of an angel or whether it will be that long dead relative whose appearance makes it without question. But we know there will be a voice. The master is come and calleth for thee. And now it will not just be a matter of Israel being gathered or the nations being gathered. It's the saints being gathered. It's us. It's you and it's me, my brothers and sisters. And that Tuesday afternoon or Friday, after, Friday morning or whatever it is, that which started out ordinary will become transformed. And then the only question will be, God gave me my life. The Lord Jesus Christ gave all. How am I living my life? How have I lived my life? In the end, the many questions of every day is, finds its fulfilment in the one question of that day. All the little choices that we make, the individual Decisions that drive us find their ultimate focus in that one question as we stand before our judge. It's not, is it, my brothers and sisters, that those who enter into the kingdom have no iniquity. It is that they have recognised it. It's not that they have no sin, but it is that they have confessed it. It's not that they have no transgression, but that they have sought forgiveness for it. They have had their iniquity blotted out. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, that they might be presented faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy. That's the purpose of the Almighty and his Son, which he's leading to. So that the Almighty might view us not as miserable sinners, but as sanctified ones for him. And that we might see ourselves as following after him, seeking his righteousness, desiring his mercy every day of our lives. Knowing that this is the only ultimate reality for us. He forgives us, not because he has forgiven worse than us, but he makes forgiveness for us. A condition that we forgive others. So that there is no room for petty feuds or grudges. We are in this together. You remember that interesting parable that the Lord told? Well, parable, that idea he said, before you go to the altar, if you remember that your brother has anything against you, then go and settle it first and then offer your gift. It doesn't say if you've got something else against your brother, because you've already forgiven him, perhaps. But if, but if he's got something against you, you've got to go and sort it out. Well, here is the most ultimate. He's the greatest altar of all, so to speak. Here we are before the Lord himself. And you and I don't want to be going there, bearing something, do we, that we should have resolved. So let us focus each day and then there's that intriguing thought in the idea we just looked at a few moments ago in Matthew 24. 
because the Lord is coming at such an hour as ye think not, be ye also ready. For if the good man had known in what hour the Lord would have come, then he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. And so, what was the only answer then? If we're to be ready when the Lord comes, and we don't know when he's coming, the only answer is to be ready all the time. And what does being ready mean? It means recognising that every day is, is, is as our last day. Whether that be in this life or as we await the coming of the Lord and his appearing to us. That this that I do today is what I would do if I really believe the Lord was coming today. It would mean setting right every relationship. Healing every breach. It would, be, it would mean being ready to drop every dusty thing, everything of dust, and hold firmly to the things of the kingdom and the things of the name. There are no perfect people, brothers and sisters, but there are, as we are, people of flesh and blood who are seeking to follow the Master, and who, for whom the entry into the kingdom is the most important thing in life. There will be nobody there, brothers and sisters, who gets there and thinks, well, it wasn't really what I wanted. It is the thing that matters for us. It has to be. And the Lord is looking for us to be following after him as the most important end and goal of our life. There's a word they use in business today that is passion, and they want people to be passionately involved in their business as the thing that drives them. And the Lord says to us, I've died for you. I've redeemed you because the Almighty is taking out of the Gentiles a people for his name, that that might drive us in our thinking, that when we stand before him, we are not perfect. We are not sinless, but he, through his righteousness, has made us right with his Father in his loving grace. So, I want to finish. Revelation 19. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I should just qualify that. I'm not intending to finish just yet, but we're on the home straight. Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Because here is the bride that we spoke of a few minutes ago. Just look at her in verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. When did she do that? She did that before the Lord came, didn't she? This is, this is what today is about, my brothers and sisters. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is God's. Today is what we have. Today is for deciding that our lives belong to him. And when he comes and we look into his face, we see his smile. That's what he's looking for us. That's what he's wanting us to want to see, isn't it? And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And perhaps there is that sense there of the, the righteousnesses or the righteous acts of saints. Not that they were perfect people. There are no perfect people, are there brothers and sisters, except the Lord himself, the one who was sinless. But all we who strugglingly seek to follow after him and to seek to help each other along that road to his kingdom. And she is granted to wear that robe of righteousness. So to those who seek to follow him and to stay in that way with all our weaknesses and our failings and seeking his mercy that we might be found in him. So, for our final act, let's go to Song of Solomon. <clears throat> because it seems to me that there's a picture here. We, 
This is the bride in preparation, brothers and sisters. The Lord goes forth. He goes forth with his bride. She is there helping him. And the bridegroom is looking for a bride of this character. And if we look at our lives now, and if there is in any sense, any way in which we think we don't yet fit this picture, then, well, we know the Lord is looking for us to seek him. To seek his mercy and his forgiveness, without which none of us will be there. But every day that he gives to us an opportunity to desire to be like the Lord. To try to be like him in character now, that we might be like him in nature then. Here he is in Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. The rose, it seems here, is not so much the roses we have in our English gardens. It, it's, not, it's, not the, uh, it's not that tea rose. It's more of the tulip, the Sharon tulip. The suggestion of the botanists is that it is the Sharon tulip. And so we have some specimens growing of this 10-inch tall plant with its bright red flowers that grows abundantly in Sharon in the spring. A red plant, brothers and sisters, quite a humble, low-growing plant. And the bride says, that's what I am. But she also says, I am the lily of the valleys. And it's not the lily of the valley flower. It is the lily. And it seems the lily was really well known in Bible times. And in fact, adorned the columns of Solomon's temple. And Shushan, the palace, was so called because of its as connection with the name of the lily. And the Hebrew name for the lily. So she sees herself on one hand as the rose and is the other as the lily. And lilies through the song are prevalent because there is references to her as the lily and there are references to him as the lily. He gathering lilies, he feeding among the lilies. And the Lord himself, of course, talks, doesn't he, about the lilies. Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet Solomon was not arrayed like one of these. Not arrayed like the lily. Solomon, the great king, was not to be arrayed like one of these lilies. For those white lilies bearing fine linen clean and white, which is the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there a parable here, brothers and sisters? Is the Lord taking us as red tulips, so to speak? We who have washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We who are powerless to save ourselves. And the Lord is giving to us the opportunity, not only of life, but of being made right with him and with his Father. We talk about sometimes the greatness of immortality and the, the fact that it's an unending life and that all our mortal ills are removed and all of those things are wonderful. And yet at the heart of it, remember what the Lord said. This is eternal life. That they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. To know him ultimately, we would need to be like him. Our attempts in this age, while we must seek after him and find him and seek to be like him, our attempts are always limited, aren't they, by the flesh. There is always that which is in the way. Whether it be our failure to perceive God's will for what it is, or our failure to do it, or our tiredness, or our limitation, they are there to be removed, for that to be taken away, for us to be able to do God's will absolutely, perfectly, as he desires. That's the essence of immortality that God wants for us, to his glory. So when he looks at the bride, he says, as the lily among thorns... He sees the rest of humanity as thorns and thistles that grew up when Adam and Eve left Eden. And he sees the bride as this beautiful lily, he who he has taken for himself and washed and purified. 
You see how in verse 9, my beloved is like a roe or a young heart. He stands behind our wall. He looks forth at the windows. And it's a slightly, uh, it's not the most ideal translation, which perhaps is, is more of this idea. He stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows. He's outside, actually. Verse 8 is said that we hear his voice. We just hear his voice on the mountains. And now in verse 9, he's come a bit closer, but he's still outside. And we can see him looking in. We can see the glimpse of his presence. We can see the sign of his approach, brothers and sisters. And when we see that, this is what he says to us. This is what he is saying to us, my brothers and sisters, is we see the sign of his approach. Verse 10. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. That's how he sees his bride. It's not how we see ourselves. But he sees us because he has given himself for us and purified us and will ultimately purify us, won't he? And make us like himself and give us his own immortal nature to present us faultless before him. That's his desire. And if it's ours, my brothers and sisters, with all of our heart, if you believe with all your heart, you may, he said, that which drives us and motivates us, then we will be with him. Verse 12, in this beautiful picture, for verse 11 says, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Here's the turtle dove, this amazing bird that just comes at the time of the Passover. Every spring, and the rain is over and gone, we just read, because it's the time of the spring, and the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of the singing is come. You see, the singing of birds, although clearly birds do sing in the spring, but it may not be the singing of birds, may it? It's a song, it's a hymn of praise, and the time of the singing is come. Some people have suggested, well, some commentators have said, well, the singing is the singing of the vine dressers, because we're going to read about them in a couple of verses. But there is another singing, isn't there? The redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And although this chapter, in its first application, clearly is to the nation of Israel, who are being relieved and returned there, they're not going to be the only ones singing, are they? <coughs> the redeemed saints are singing praise to their father, aren't they? They, they were doing it in Revelation. <coughs> and so the time of the singing is the time we wait for. The time of the singing of the bride, when she is united with the bridegroom, redeemed and ransomed in her turn, just as Israel the nation will be in God's purpose. We have that picture in verse 13 of grapes and figs that speaks of Israel restored. So it's the time we live in, perhaps, then, brothers and sisters. Chapter 4 and verse 7. Because this is how the bridegroom sees his bride. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. This is how he sees his bride. He's died for her. He's done all for her. Rotherham translates it, Thou art all over beautiful, my fair one, and blemish is there none in thee, presented faultless before the throne of God that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious ecclesia, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it might be without blemish, like the sacrifice, for the service of God, to his glory, for his purpose. And when she is called away to him, just think of that beautiful picture. When Messiah is enthroned king of the land and proceeds to take possession of it to its utmost limits, he will then say to his companions, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Armana, from the top of Shenir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. 
taking up their position upon that commanding board of the sons of Zion, may view the landscape of a goodly and glorious land, fragrant of rich odours and flowing with milk and honey, outstretching eastward in the, all the length of Euphrates to the East Sea. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, the Lord taking us by the hand, by his, with his bride, and wanting us to be with him and rejoicing in that which he is bringing about? Is there not a vision for us? in that which he presents. So then, my brothers and sisters, as we await the coming of the Lord, he invites us each day to seek for him. That's what he says to us every single day, in effect, isn't it? He stands at the door and knocks, as he has done in his word, as the events of our life, perhaps, unfold before us and we're called to think deeply upon what is really important to us and he says I'm at the door he's at the door with us in our difficulty if only we will seek him and he's at the door in the sense that very soon we will hear that call to come to him and to be with him when the Lord goes forth he's not on his own he is with a redeemed host from all nations and from all generations. And we in our turn are seeking day by day to follow after him. In God's mercy, he will bring us there. If we <coughs> truly desire to be there and if we set our heart and seek his mercy and his forgiveness day by day. That it might not only be Israel who is gathered back to their land that the nations of the world gathered to Israel, but the saints gathered to be with the Lord, to be with him forever, until finally every being that lives honours the Father with every fibre of their being, and God is truly all in all.